Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of GitLab's Ask a Hacker. I'm Lawrence Bierner, Director of Application Security here at GitLab, and today we're chatting with Alex Chapman, a security researcher who has made uh, significant contributions to the GitLab security program uh, through his ethical uh, disclosure of vulnerabilities he's found. Um, a contributor to many other companies and organizations as well, Alex has been a HackerOne security researcher since 2017 with a total of 81 vulnerabilities discovered. Welcome, Alex. Uh, thanks for taking the time today to chat with us. We really appreciate that. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and maybe about your career as a uh, security researcher. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Lawrence. And uh, thanks for having me. So uh, as you say, I'm a full-time bug bounty hunter, um, which I've actually been doing full-time for the past just over two years now. Um, but before that, I've been a penetration tester as an uh, as a external consultant. I've been part of internal red teams. Um, I actually worked for Bug Bounty Platform for uh, just under 12 months. And, uh, and then I took the leap to doing uh, bug, bounty, bug Bounty hunting full-time from there. Excellent. And when you say full-time Bug Bounty hunting, this is, this is your gig. This is what you do. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. This is my, uh, scarily, this is my only source of income. So uh, that's where I spend most of my time, obviously. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, I, I think I can speak for several uh, probably on this call. Uh, we're, we're, we're a little envious of, of you in there. So that is that is awesome to hear. Uh, so you know uh, the uh, sort of the format here. We're going to go through some of the questions we have in our document. Uh, I encourage everyone um, who has joined us to uh, add questions to the doc. Um, we'll get to them, we'll read them off, we'll get uh, Alex to chat a little bit about them, and, um, and let's get started. So our first question... Or Lawrence, I was going to say, just because we have so many, yeah, I'll read, I'll read them off um, for the folks who put them in, and then, yeah, we can all crowdsource and take notes. Does that work? That works, yeah. Okay, perfect. So then, Alex, our first question is from James Ritchie, and he asked, what approach do you take when you're looking for security issues in software? Sure, and this is obviously a very broad question, um, so I'll, I'll try and try and give a, a general answer. But uh, so when I'm looking for for vulnerabilities, I I prefer to look at in software that is either open source or or client side um, applications where I can either reverse engineer the application or, or get some more information than just kind of your traditional um, web application testing or, or black box testing. Uh, this is purely because it has been a long time interest of mine and I've, I've got some quite good tooling and, and uh, built up some good skills around that. Um, but in terms of the sorts of issues I'm looking for, I, I certainly have a, a list of common things I check for. So um, I think early on I, I had a lot of success with DNS rebinding issues um, in certainly client side applications. Uh, actually, I think one of my GitLab bugs was a, was a DNS rebinding issue. Uh, one, of, one of the first ones I reported to GitLab. Um, so I had quite a lot of success with those. So I certainly have a, a stock of, of um, vulnerabilities I, I go looking for. But I also try and understand the application and, and what it does and come at it from what, are, what would be a business logic issue? What would be, what does this application do? And what would be kind of the worst case scenario if somebody was able to, to um to, to get around the business logic of, of the application. So that doesn't necessarily lend itself to a particular class of issues. Um, it's more an outcome that I'm trying to get to. Uh, and I'll always set an outcome as, uh, as a goal for my period of, of, uh, of research against a particular application. Great, thank you. And then our second question is from Dominic. Is there anything that you're not seeing much or even at all from the bug bounty programs that you think should be more widespread? Yeah, this one had me thinking for a while because um, I could go on for a long time on this or, uh, or, or I could boil it down to, to the key thing. And then I was thinking about it. And one thing that I think I've only seen on one program is education about the product. So we, we have these, um, these companies who, who have these bug bounty programs, but some of them don't even say what the product is or what the company does. And the more a bug bounty program can help the participants understand 
what the product is, how it works, how to use it, what the worst case outcomes would be. What, uh, and all of the kind of internal, uh, internal risk struggles of the product. All of that information is helpful. There's one, I would love to be able to say who it is, but it's a, it's a private bug bounty program who actually provides hackers access to their full training platform for the products. Um, so they can get to learn exactly how users use the products. And I, I'm just, I'm actually somewhat shocked that more programs aren't doing that. Because the, the more you can help uh, bug bounty hunters and hackers understand your your product and your your offerings, the the more value you're going to be going to be getting out of them, and the more um, the more people will be willing to engage with that product. That is an excellent point, Alex, and uh, something all bug bounty programs I think can can learn from there in that answer. Yeah, thank you. Next one is from Lawrence. Tell us a bit about an interesting security vulnerability you identified, and in particular, what you found interesting about it. Again, was was thinking on this one for a little while. Um, unfortunately, the one I really want to talk about, I'm not allowed to talk about because it's not been not been published. But I, I can I can talk about it in generics um, because it's a bit of an area of of it, well, it combines a lot of interests of mine. So uh, it was an an online game that had a um, uh, a scripting engine that could be used for custom game modes. And uh, the, the, the particular company had done, done a lot of hardening of the particular scripting engine, but not their bindings to it. So I was able to reverse engineer the application uh, locally using Ghidra and kind of work out how all the, um, the Lua bindings and hooks were working in this application. And it turned out they were using the exact same um, libraries as they would distribute with the client side application on their servers. So I was able to develop a, a full uh, export chain for this, for this game, um, bypassing all the mitigations that were required. So ASLR, um, read write memory, all the rest of it locally on, uh, on, on my Linux desktop. And it worked first time when I uh, flung it against their servers in the, uh, in the cloud. And that was, that's never happened to me before in my life. Um, so I was, I was particularly happy about that. And it, it kind of felt like browser exploitation maybe seven, eight, nine years ago um, in terms of the things that I could do uh, and, the, and the access that I had. So it was a really fun thing to, to pull apart. Um, I was quite into gaming at the time, so it kind of brought up, brought up that passion as well. But um, I'm, I'm, peti I'm petitioning to get uh, some of those issues published. So hopefully at some point in the near future, I will be able to talk about them. Excellent. Thanks for that. So interesting. All right. And Jorn said, what was your worst disclosure experience? Thank you for this one. Um, I, well, so I've only been a bug, hunt, or bug bounty hunter for uh, three or four years. Uh, I have been submitting bugs to, to company, third, third party companies for the best part of a decade. And I've had, had some very interesting um, experiences. I, I don't want to name and shame anyone. Um, but there was a particular IoT vendor who um, found out about a bug um, on, I think it was a Friday afternoon. Um, their lawyers contacted my boss about an hour later, and it was it was a holiday weekend um, in the UK, which my boss had to entirely forfeit, uh, speaking to their lawyers for uh, for the best part of three or four days um, over over a vulnerability report that was my responsibility. Um, so that, that was probably the, the, the scariest um, that I've had. I also have vendors completely misunderstand um, the reason I'm getting in contact with them. So there was one particular vendor who ended up putting me in contact with their sales team and managed to get me on a sales call with their, uh, one, of their, one of their sales team who was convinced I wanted to buy their products. And um, that was uh, a particular waste of time for, for, for all of us. Um, Ranging through to, uh, there was a, a particular very popular uh, VPN provider who um, just outright denied what I was saying was, was a bug. Um, and it was a situation where we could man in the middle all VPN traffic um, going through their VPN, which to me seemed like a really big deal. Um, 
but they they decided it wasn't their problem. It was actually down to the operating system and they were just going to have nothing to do with it. So uh, that, that was a particularly frustrating, um, frustrating experience. So that I've got a, a large number of bad experiences over my years, but more recently with bug bounty programs uh, and having dedicated teams to to report to, there have been fewer and fewer and fewer, which is which is fantastic. Awesome. And then this is a fun one. What's your favorite scene from the movie Hacker? I did have to rewatch the movie to to think on this one. Um, it's definitely the, um, the the phone box hacking scene where they're all there, the music's blaring, they're all in their individual phone boxes, but working together as a team. Completely unrealistic with the visuals, but it's just fantastic. The camaraderie and the teamwork that are going on in that, uh, and the music tying it all together is um, is iconic, certainly. Honestly, Alex, that, that is that is exactly what uh, what I in my career have previously pictured in my mind when I've been doing uh, penetration tests or or ethical hacking. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. The, the closest I've come to it would have been a live hacking event working with uh, with some other researchers, but we we didn't have the phone boxes or the or the cool little Pac Man going across the screen, unfortunately. So uh, one day. Great. And our next question: How did you decide you wanted to start working full time on bug bounties? Sure. Um, this is this is a bit of a difficult question for me. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of based in tragedy. My uh, my wife and I lost our first daughter um, a few years back. Uh, I was working at Hacker One at the time and took some time off from from work. Um, they were very generous and, and gave me uh, as long as I needed off uh, after after that. And I, I came back at the start of the the next year and first day in the office I, I just knew I wasn't ready to come back to work um, and I didn't want to leave them hanging obviously they, they were keeping a position open for me but so I, I, I handed in my notice there and kind of took a few more months to uh, recover with my wife and uh, and think about what was important to me and it was then that I kind of realized I wasn't ready for full-time commitment but was very passionate about security and bug hunting. So having worked with bug hunters um, and doing, doing a little bit of bug bounty work kind of part-time in, in my own time, I felt I was at a stage where I could actually break out and try and try and do this as, well, first to, to cover the bills. Um, I did very, did, uh, very well in that first year and just kind of kept going from there. It was um, started off as a bit of a, an experiment and it Kind of kept it going to this day so been very fortunate in that respect thank you yeah and thank you for sharing it's always amazing to be vulnerable and on these virtual calls with each other and then number seven i'm interested in this too what's the biggest bounty you've ever received whenever you talk about bug bounty hunting mon money obviously comes up it's uh, it's something everyone's interested in well so i don't normally talk about um money for individual bugs that, that I um, that I submit some of them do get either publicly disclosed through through the bug bounty platforms or um, bug bounty marketing teams get get involved because because they are talking about, about quite high amounts um, I think the biggest public issue that I've been awarded would have been uh, actually the end of last year um, working with the Atlassian Bitbucket team um, and they were putting together new infrastructure around their CI CD pipeline and uh, using um, CATS containers to try, to try and uh, isolate their CI uh, build jobs. Uh, and I was able to find a way to break out of the containerized environment and affect the, uh, the, the underlying Kubernetes hosts. Uh, so they were very generous in that and they, they awarded a $20,000 bounty on, on that particular um, bug and kind of full, full exploit chain. Thank you. And then number, let's see, number eight from Penny. How do you choose which technologies and bugs to focus on for both learning and bug hunting? Okay, that's, yeah. Very good question there. So I, I certainly, when I'm, when I'm trying to hit my targets with bug hunting, obviously I, 
I do this as a job. So I set a monthly target of, of how much money I, I want to make. I do, excuse me, do focus on um, bugs that I'm familiar with and targets that I'm familiar with. So I certainly have several programs that I know I can reliably um, hunt for bugs on and find issues on. Um, and I tend to, if I'm trying to hit my targets, I tend to try and stay in my comfort zone and not, not stray too far from there. So um, that'll be kind of classic web bugs, although I am a, a terrible web app tester um, or things like I, I mentioned before, DNS rebinding or, or other issues that I know how to quickly look for and quickly exploit. Um, if I feel like I'm doing well in a month or I'm ahead of my financial targets, that's where I'll stretch myself and look for more interesting bugs and research perhaps technologies that I've not been so familiar with. So the past 12 months, certainly uh, I've had a focus on uh, container security and um, uh, container escapes. So Kubernetes, Docker, uh, and all the rest of it. And that, that started from a, I was kind of ahead of my targets and, and this was something that I really wanted to spend some time learning and actually worked out very well for me this past 12 months. So it's, it's very much a balance of what do I need to look for to, to pay the rent? And then what do I want to look for, for interest and to, to expand my knowledge? So interesting. You're like your own, uh, like business owner. Uh, entirely. Yes. <laughs> Our next question is any good resources for learning about cloud security for bug bounty uh -huh. and security code review? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure I can find some, so I, I will circle back to that one. Um, I think generally the way I approach it is reading source code um, and just trying to understand a, a, a particular project. So um, I've been learned or teaching myself Go again over the past 12 months, primarily because containerized um, and container software seems to be written in Go. Uh, and that's helped me learn uh, and understand Docker and Kubernetes projects and to hunt for bugs in those projects. But um, in terms of actual resources, other than getting online and reading through the source code, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll swing back to that one. Okay, great. And then I'm looking through the notes. Let's see here. So Heather, should we go, should we go to number 10 or nine and 10 related? Not, please go ahead to number 10. That's me okay. making a mistake. Oh, no worries. So any recommended strategy for for a bug hunter starting out with lots of time to learn and practice? I mean, CTF versus recreating exploits for public CVEs versus bug bounty directly, learning development? Yeah, again, a very broad question. And I know um, a lot of other bug hunters have, have kind of approached this and, uh, and, and put out their own ways of doing this. Um, personally, I... I wouldn't necessarily recommend starting with bug bounty if you're if you're brand new to security. Um, it's learning the basics of programming or networking or um, or even even hacking, but on targets on test systems. Um, I know, uh, for example, um, Tom Nom Nom um, on Twitter has just put out a an introduction to networking for for people wanting to, to learn to hack, uh, actually I think might have only gone out yesterday, uh, which is a fantastic resource. And it, I think having a, an initial goal of learning to hack is, is very admirable, but I kind of think that should be an end goal. Um, there's a lot of technologies and learning technologies that um, has certainly helped me in, in this process. As I say, I'm 13, nearly 14 years through this this learning process and I, I feel like I'm still relatively uh, inexperienced in a, in a lot of areas so it's um, doing CTFs is really good but then does teach some bad uh, bad habits that there's always a way in in a CTF where that's not necessarily the case um, on a bug bounty target um, an important skill in Bug bounty is actually knowing when to move on and knowing when to um, give up on a target. Doesn't mean you'll give up on it forever, but um, moving on from it to, to focus on something else. Uh, so CTF kind of blurs that line a little bit. 
but there are a lot of good online resources, certainly for getting started in bug bounty as well, um, that I am happy to link to after this uh, after this event. Wonderful. And then, yes, we are we're at um, the 51 minute mark, so we'll see what we can get through in the next few minutes. The next question is, what do you think about recon automation? Do you use it or prefer manual tests on main apps? Uh, I'm I'm not a particular fan of uh, automated recon. I, I like to go kind of what I would say deep on a target rather than wide across all targets. Um, my my main interest in automated recon is on the development side of it. I, I sometimes um, develop side projects that could be used in automation, but I generally do that as a as a fun side project rather than actually putting it into, into production. Um, I don't like the race aspect of automated um, bug hunting and, uh, and recon. It feels like you're racing a lot of other hackers out there to try and find the same bugs. Um, whereas I prefer to get to know a, a target in a much more uh, deeper, deeper way to try and find bugs that no other hacker is either looking for or could find. Awesome. And then the next one, time management being a struggle, bug bounties have a big learning curve. And with that, we have to practice, look for bugs, spend time with family, all the other stuff outside of work. Any tips here? How do you manage all that? Yeah, badly, um, very badly. Um, so before, before my second daughter uh, came along, I was, uh, I was able to spend hours and hours in front of the keyboard. Um, with it without too many other responsibilities since my, since my second order came along um, well, 11 months ago now. Um, I've been having to balance my time a lot more um, and fitting uh, bug hunting in around childcare and all the rest of it. So some of the biggest things and revelations for me were, were note-taking. I was terrible at note-taking uh, and now I kind of write absolutely everything down that I can, even if I don't think it's particularly useful at the time. Um, it can sometimes spark something several days later and I can go back and find those notes. Uh, so I do I actually use GitLab um, issue reporting for all of my, my bug hunting notes. So I'll, if I come across something that I think might be worth looking at, I'll create a new, uh, a new issue, tag it as a lead, write down why I think it might be worth looking at in the future um, and any notes I can think of at that time. And then if I'm um, interested in looking at it there and then I'll just keep appending my notes to, to that issue um, and if it comes to nothing I'll tag it as not a bug or if it comes to if I get a bug or two out of it I'll, I'll link those to new issues and, and write reports in, in these new issues um, and at the end of each session I always make sure I, I take five ten minutes to write down any outstanding thoughts um, and just really try and keep on top of my thoughts uh, I find GitLab issues very useful as well. So I can, when I wake up in the middle of the night with a spark of inspiration, I can just jump on my phone, add that or append that to, to an issue and then kind of push it off till morning. Whereas um, perhaps before I might have got up and, uh, and, and started working on that. That's not really viable for me these days. Certainly getting older, I need my sleep. I, I'm going to share that with our, our um, team who does all the issues. They'll love hearing that feedback. All right, so the next one is from someone who's a full-time pen tester at a consultancy. I want to spend more time doing bug bounties, but I don't want to quit my job. Do you think part-time employment, part-time bounty approach can work, combining some guaranteed salary with the flexibility of bug bounties? Sure. Um, it can definitely work depending on levels of skill and levels of drive, I think. Um, I was very... I'm very cautious recommending people take up bug bounty full time. Um, I I said I've published a blog about um, when I did it um, a couple of years ago, and I was very careful to say that I I went into this with um, money in the bank and my wife working a, a a good job, so I was very low risk in starting um, bug bounty as a, as a full time career. Uh, if it had gone wrong I would have been fine I wouldn't have lost the house or um, put myself in financial hardship and that's that's the biggest thing I want to say to anybody's interested in getting into bug bounty full-time as, as a career 
it's it's great while it's going great, but it can be really difficult if you're not meeting your targets or not earning money. Um, that being said, it's very difficult to do on top of a day job. I tried that for a little while as well. It becomes a real grind um, doing your your day job and then in the evenings trying to trying to find bugs. So it's about getting a balance there. If and um, going part time to do bug bounty hunting would be a, a valid way to, uh, as the as the um, question says, to kind of mitigate some of those risks. Um, all I can say is if if you feel like you're at that that point and you have the, uh, the financial backing that you, that you could do that and your current company would be willing to let you do that, I, I would say yes, it, it is viable, but um, make sure everything's in place and, and that you're financially stable enough to do it. Perfect. And the next one you, you touched on with the taking notes, which was super helpful. So we'll skip to 15 and 16 and wrap this up uh, before the hour mark. So number 15 is what would you recommend to someone who wants to start working with GitLab's bug bounty program? Um, first, learn Ruby. Um, I, I am very disappointed that GitLab's written in Ruby. I'm not a fan, I have to say. Um, I, I had to reteach myself Ruby. Um, I, I've written in Python for the best part of seven, eight, nine years. Um, and more recently, as I said, Go. GitLab does have some Go components. I have been focusing heavily on those as well. Um, but read, read the source, it's all there. Read the issues. Um, you can see what's going on. You can see what's going on in the, in the, the considerations of how issues are fixed. Um, all of the fixed security issues are all also um, published on the, the GitLab issue tracker. Read through them, see what other people have been submitting, see how they've been, the issues have been fixed. And yeah, I, it's all there. This is one of the things I really like about the GitLab program is it is all there, it's all open. Even the, the, uh, the documentation and a lot of the internal employee documentation is open there to read. Uh, and that really does help, one, get up to speed on what GitLab does, how it does it in its architecture, and two, how you can get started doing um, and learning the GitLab code base. Great. And then we'll, we have one final question here and anything else we'll um, work on async as Heather noted. So this last question Fantastic. is what, what bug types do you find the most? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, find the most, unfortunately, is probably things like cross-site scripting, um, which are bugs that I don't particularly enjoy finding or enjoy reporting, but there are still a lot of them out there. Um, I prefer looking for other bugs but as, as i said cross-site scripting we're still seeing I, I i'm astounded we're still seeing it but i think um it was probably the first bug i found in my first security job 14 years ago and i still i found one yesterday uh, which is which is horrendous that we've uh, we, we haven't made a progress in in 15 years but um unfortunately it probably is that Great, and we're right at time. Lawrence, you wanna finish this off with some final words? Sure, thanks, Christy. Um, so Alex, uh, we really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your, your really your, your entire personal day, contributing to other bug bounty programs, uh, time with your family to spend chatting with us. Um, thank you for all you do for GitLab. Uh, please continue hunting on our platform, using our platform, uh, we enjoy uh, your bugs, your feedback, and uh, and really appreciate everything you're doing for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone uh, who's joined us today. And thank you for all the questions. Uh, this is a great discussion. And we hope to see everyone next time on our next edition of Ask a Hacker. Thank you.